Welcome, welcome, welcome. On behalf of PEN America's Campus Free Speech Program, I'd like to welcome you all to the first convening of our new virtual series, The Common Room, a weekly program for faculty, administrators, staff, and students to explore issues at the intersection of free speech, academic freedom, diversity, and inclusion in higher education. Thank you for the, taking the time to be with us today. My name is Jonathan Friedman and I direct the Campus Free Speech Program at PEN America, where we have grown deeply concerned about the state of these issues relating to free speech and the executive order uh, on combating race and sex stereotyping in higher education. We see it as integral to our mission to celebrate literature and defend the civil liberties that make it possible to stand up against this executive order and make clear what kind of a chilling effect it is having on campuses across the country. A few ground rules for today's program. First, uh, in the first half an hour, we'll be rec uh, recording the conversation, and the conversation will be limited to me and our special guests. In the second half, we'll cease recording, and we're going to open it up for Q&A. Participants, you'll all be invited to raise hands or drop questions in the chat. I want to stress that this is a forum for interaction and open dialogue. We ask that everybody speak to one another with respect, and remember, of course, on Zoom, to mute when you're not speaking. So we have watched at PEN America as college and university leaders across this country, wary of jeopardizing their federal funding, are postponing, delaying, pausing their diversity trainings and academic talks that might run afoul of this order from the president. I've heard whispers of content reviews and new scrutiny of syllabi and curriculum from different corners of the country. And today we're trying to bring together some of those whispers into a clear and shared conversation. The point of today's program is an effort to understand not only the executive order better, but to gain a sense of its scope, its impact, and to discuss ways that higher education, faculty, staff, and administrators can respond. To that end, I am delighted to be joined today in the common room by Emerson Sykes, staff attorney for the ACLU, and Jennifer Ho, professor of ethnic studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, and the current president of the Association of Asian American Studies. Emerson, Jennifer, thank you both for being here. A pleasure. Thanks for having us. So we're going to start off with you, Emerson, first. We at Penn, as I mentioned, have raised some concern about this executive order, the dangerous impacts it's having on free speech and academic freedom across the country, and we've called for its revocation. You are an expert in free speech and constitutional rights and the First Amendment at the ACLU. How do you see this order? What bothers you about it? <laughs> Well, uh, thanks, Jonathan, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be on this inaugural common room. Uh, what bothers me about this executive order is everything about it. It's dripping with, um, you know, the kind of the worst kind of use of racism and racialized language uh, in a sort of backwards and too clever by half attempt uh, to sort of portray themselves, the, the White House and the administration as being colorblind and uh, uh, in favor of all human equality, while in fact what they're doing is trying to shut down critical discussions of uh, American society, American culture, American history, uh, and as academics, as activists, as people living in this country, it's uh, disgusting and it's horrifying that this is a priority that the White House would set. So, I mean, the fact that, th that this administration would issue an executive order on combating race and, sexual and, and sex stereotyping, just the name of it uh, is absurd. Um, so there's plenty of things to, to really be upset about. The messaging is clear. They want to chill speech. They want to silence people from talking about systemic racism, anti-racism, uh, basically challenging the status quo with regard to race and sex. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find probably anyone on this call, but also folks who think critically about this country that don't think that we need to reevaluate and, and reconsider how we approach some of these issues. So that's what horrifies me about it. I mean, as a principle, as a legal principle, I think, uh, you know, it's very, it's vague. It's intentionally vague. It uh, is intentionally chilling. Uh, but it does set out from what we can put together, it applies differently to different kinds of entities. So there's government agencies, uh, there's contractors, there's grantees, and the rules vary slightly based on each of those. And I think the actual constitutional claims vary uh, between those different kinds of covered entities. And we can go into that perhaps if, if that's interesting to folks. But uh, I think there's a variety of different kinds of legal arguments that we might want to formulate. Uh, based on strategy, based on the details of what's in the 
order, but in general, uh, you know, it's it's horrifying and disgusting. Horrifying and disgusting. So strong words. Um, I'm curious, Jennifer, how you view it. You're a scholar of critical race theory, and you have been tracking uh, not just the, the executive order, but other directives from the Trump administration, particularly since the, the kind of end of the summer, attacking critical race theory, and, and this executive order appears to be part of it. Um, how do you view this and other recent efforts by the Trump administration? Yes, thank you. So it's, um, I mean, I think it's important for us to really take a broad view and understand what this is, right? Which is to say, it is an executive order coming out of the White House a few months, when it, when it came out back in September, right? A few months ahead of a very contested um, presidential election that I believe, in my opinion, was designed to stir up certain segments of, um, I don't even necessarily want to say Republican base, I want to say the Trump space, right? The kind of, you know, make America great again, um, I'm going to lambast what I think critical race theory is without understanding what critical race theory is and make certain assumptions about all forms of thinking about race and racism are in and of themselves racist because that is certainly the kinds of things that are being populated in the um, anonymous comments threads, if anyone has the stomach to read those sort of things. So, um, so this is a, a kind of a purely political maneuver. And yet it is having a chilling effect within structures of higher education. And I think it's then something for us to think about for those of us who are in higher education, what was the commitment of our colleges and universities to equity and inclusion, right? So I wanna kind of go back before these executive orders to the summer when the nation and the world were um, reeling from the video footage of George Floyd being killed, being suffocated to death. And, and, right, and then there was these, this outrage, right? This rightly so, this outrage where people were coming together and you know, taking to the streets calling um, for change and universities and colleges were one of those places that responded, right? Like we know that this has hit mainstream to a certain extent when you have major corporations that are putting out solidarity statements about Black Lives Matter. So there's all of this momentum moving into the fall semester that George Floyd's death was a catalyst to talk about things like defunding the police and to talk about systemic racism, particularly anti-Black racism, but then also to talk about settler colonialism and a host of other things that, again, we could say fall into the, under the umbrella of critical race theory and or diversity. And so then you have this White House memo coming out saying that this is un-American, this is wrong. Um, it's interesting to me, the universities that have, and they're sadly, too few who have actually taken a stand and made public statements. So the University of Michigan, their president has made a statement decrying the executive order. And, and essentially I think, and I would defer to Emerson whether this would, would hold up in terms of legal, a legal challenge, right? But basically saying that they are going to continue to dismantle structural racism. So um, I don't know that the letter specifically says, you know, gives a, a middle finger to the executive order, but it essentially uses very strong language to say that, that they find the executive order to be wrong and that they're going to continue to dismantle structural racism. Um, but what I have been hearing anecdotally, and I don't have permission to share specific stories about this, but I have been hearing from friends and colleagues from around the nation that humanities professors, for example, are changing their syllabi so that um, they are not teaching anything that they think are going to be in violation of this executive order. And I am also hearing from friends as recently as last night who privately messaged me to let me know that behind closed doors, what they're being told is to take out certain language in their, um, in their diversity training and to take a wait and see approach until after November 23rd. Um, and then of course there's the University of Iowa, which is, which is very public, right? They've just decided to cancel or reschedule their diversity trainings. Um, and I've actually asked the leadership at my own university, the University of Colorado, if there's any plans, if the lawyers have looked at it. And what I was told from the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences is that um, the University of Colorado has no position to comply with the executive order like or rather they're not 
they're not doing anything, right? So I want to be really clear because I don't want to get my university in trouble or myself in trouble with my university. Um, the the current the current statement from the dean of the college of arts and science is that they are this is not on their you know they're not doing anything about this there's there is no response is i think the the safest way that i can put it you know it's really quite shocking i think for me as someone who's been following issues around free speech and academic freedom on campuses for many years uh to hear in particular this this it's quite troubling to hear that people might be changing their syllabi in response to this executive order. And that, that's, I think, one of the key things here when we talk about you know, the chilling of free speech and that kind of impact on what people do. It's not always only through kind of direct uh, actions, but kind of direct, directives uh, like this executive order. But before we get deeper into that and, and you know, ways that, that universities have and haven't responded or should be, uh, you know, I'm curious just to play devil's advocate for a minute and ask you, Emerson, to elaborate on you know, your knowledge of this, I mean, from a legal standpoint, isn't this within the federal government's authority to determine how federal funding is spent? I know we often have seen the Trump administration uh, bend rules around uh, what is acceptable and what is not, but then are able to kind of say, oh, well, you know, and other administrations have done things before and, and nobody gets angry and this is kind of just partisan uh, rancor about this. So, you know, I, I was thinking about like, what if this was an executive order banning schools from you know teaching white supremacy or teaching false history or something like that, you know, would that be different? Would pe should people be as upset? It's a good question. I mean, I think you know, I'm assuming that the the group of folks that are on this call join the call because they're somewhat familiar with what's in the executive order. But maybe in order to answer your question, it's worth just spelling out actually what is in the order. I mean, uh, the first part is sort of the preamble where you just get a lot of, you know, sort of, I don't know what, I don't want to use the word dog whistle because it's more like a dog foghorn or something like that. But this is where they talk about, um, you know, how we need to be unified as a country and nobody's better than anybody else. And the suggestion that anyone is better than anybody else uh, is, you know, repugnant to our founding father's genius. Um, you know, read it on not on a full stomach, I suggest. Um, but it's, it's really just the messaging and the chilling that, that Jennifer and Jonathan, you were talking about. It's, it's laying out for who the audience is and it's trying to rile up a certain kind of base. Um, but then when you get into the parts that are actually sort of the actual executive order, the legal requirements and enforcement and who's covered, really it's about these ideas, the divisive, uh, divisive concepts and racial and sex stereotypes, right? So that covers all of the, the weird, that, that's the backwards way of covering uh, anti-racism. And it says within 60 days, the federal government will be writing into their contracts uh, terms that require that, so that, 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 that those types of divisive concepts and racial and sex stereotypes are not being used. But it, it applies to the uniform services, it applies to federal agencies, it applies to contractors and it applies to grantees. But as you said, Jonathan, the, the government uh, does have a right to decide how it speaks itself and how it spends its own money, right? So the First Amendment is really about limiting the power of the government to limit private speech, right? So what we're really worried about is government censorship of private speech. But when the government speaks on its own behalf, of course it gets to say whatever it wants. It can have a viewpoint, it can be biased, it can be all of these things because the government is allowed to have its own viewpoint, right? Uh, so in terms of spending, what that means is that the government can decide who it contracts with, who it gives grants to, uh, and it can even favor certain types of positions or ideas. Now, of course, there's also, you can't, you know, have a racial discrimination in how you contract. You can't, you know, discriminate against female contractors or something like that in your contracting process. But you can absolutely, as the government say, we want to give a whole bunch of money to groups that hold this particular position or that are going to advance these sets of ideas. So um, that covers, that's the reason why as much as we think that this executive order is repugnant, its, mes its message is clear, its intention is clear, and it's abhorrent to uh, a democratic nation, there's not gonna be a very strong legal challenge 
two internal regulations within the federal government saying we're no longer going to do these types of trainings, right? They're allowed to decide what kinds of trainings they do for their own employees, whether they're uniformed or members of specific agencies, right? Internal federal government funding, they can attach a lot of different kinds of strings to it. We can speak out. We can say it's not a good idea. We can say that we think that these people should be voted out of office for making these types of decisions. Uh, but legally, they're not prohibited from regulating how it spends its own money on its own staff training. But, but it's different for contractors, you're saying? Yes, exactly. So for contractors, then it is, uh, it's been written in, basically, let me do grantees first, because I think the grantees are a little bit more clear, because the grantees, it says, if you're getting federal funding, you can't use it for this type of training or these types of, this, to promote these types of ideas. Again, repugnant, but that's the government using its own money and it can decide how it gives out money and what terms are attached to that money. And if you don't like it, and if you wanna do it, you can use other types of funding, right? It doesn't prohibit you from doing it. It just says that you can't use that federal grant to do that type of training, but repugnant, but not illegal. The real problem comes with contractors. And I think we're talking about it in the context of campus speech. So I'm really curious. It doesn't, it's not clear how universities might be covered either as grantees or contractors. I mean, you can imagine, you know, Pell Grant, there's all sorts of ways that federal funding flows to both public and private universities and how that's gonna be considered under this executive order is something that remains to be seen. But the biggest problem that we have in terms of government restricting private speech is for contractors, it basically says, if you have any federal contracts, you cannot engage in any of these types of trainings, whether you're using federal money or not. And so that is the real restriction on private speech by the government. And so that's the one that we're most worried about uh, and the one that's most different from the government deciding how it spends its own money, right? Because this actually applies to contractors, whether they're using federal money or not. And obviously many contractors have a whole variety of funding and if one donor can d dictate how you do all of your business, uh, it's a huge problem. I mean, I can get into your hypothetical, but I've also been going on for a while. Maybe I can leave it. No, there. I, I, I think I think that's I mean, highly alarming to kind of frame it that way as we think about, you know, the vast, I always say, you know, most universities, even colleges, even a small college is essentially a city. Uh, it's It's got so much going on, so many arms. The notion that the government could put out this dictate and then have all, you know, like, as you said, one donor controlling everything that's happening there, you know, it seems pretty highly alarming. And then on top of that, that the language of it is so vague. You know, I wanted to ask you, Jennifer, just to bring you in, and then maybe we'll come back to that hypothetical, Emerson, you know, the vagueness of the language and then the impact that that's having, Jennifer, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm super annoyed by the, by the language, right? Like, I'm super annoyed by, um, like I'm looking at the memo um, from September 4th. So Jonathan, I'm not sure if you put the link in, um, whether it was the September, I mean, there's been so many memos that this White House has put out, but I'll just go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, so I, I um, have a high tolerance, I guess, for reading the anonymous comments threads where maybe I shouldn't or Twitter. Um, and there was a tweet that was posted a few days ago um, that asked that, that there's something going on at UNC. So I was trying to like track down what was happening and I was reading the, the original tweet. And then I was reading people's um, replies to the tweet that was sort of inquiring about, you know, what's going on with UNC in this executive order. And the really disturbing and sort of fascinating thing is there were conservative Twitter immediately started to reply to this tweet that was sent to academic Twitter. So for those of you who are not on social media, not on Twitter, right? There's these different hashtags and they kind of thread. And, um, and uh, you know, maybe this isn't fair to say, but my guess is that the majority of the re conservative replies were not coming from the academic Twitterverse. There were just people who, you know, anytime there's a mention of critical race theory um, or the executive order were piling on. And the kinds of things that they were saying about critical race theory made me incredibly sad. And, and let me explain why. I, I've done a really poor job as a critical race theorist in helping people to understand what this discipline is, because there is so much misunderstanding about critical race theory. 
And the kinds of things and the assumptions that people were making about what critical race theory is made me think like, there is a vast anti-intellectualism that is happening that just is heartbreaking to me, right? So in other words, if people wanna, you know, I, I think it's perfectly fine to have an intellectual debate about the merits or, or controversies or competing ideas about anything, right? Including critical race theory. But to, to misunderstand that it is that it is a discipline, right? Like that is what's driving me bananas right now is I wanted, I, and I didn't, I, re, I resisted the urge to reply to everyone. But what I wanted to say to people was, you're talking, you're attacking something like English, right? The subject of English, like it is a subject, it is a discipline. There are academics and scholars that have been writing, there are journals, there are, you know, like people get degrees in critical race theory. This is not some kind of weird, like movement that, that just because the White House says it's the critical race theory movement, it is not a movement, it is a discipline. It's like going after algebra, right? Like it's like going after physics. And that's, that's one of the things that I think really makes me want to bang my head against the wall. Like if you wanna argue with me, argue with me, that's fine, right? But, to, but the fact that we can't live on the same plane of reality and agree on basic things. Um, well, I, you know, as a basic question, you know, is there one critical race theory? I mean, to me, what you're describing is actually a field in which people debate and disagree that could be very lively. And, it, you know, not only do I don't think it shouldn't be censored, but that it's probably not even that easily um, summarized. Correct. It's not like there's a leader of critical race theory, right? Um, it's not, yeah, it's not like there's a headquarters. And you're right, Jonathan, there is no, there is not one single theory. It is, it is a field of study. Yeah. So let, let's come back then to that question of the vagueness, because, you know, in my view, I think part of why we're seeing this kind of widespread um, impact and uncertainty and kind of the whispering about a lot of this is that is that the language itself has the potential to apply not only to like every conversation on a campus, you know, you're uh, leading a program in a residence hall or you're teaching a class or you're just the president speaking to the university. I mean, it seems that it's really quite vague and that therefore in order to, I think, um, uh, uh, assure like not being found non-compliant, universities are kind of perhaps over-exaggerating, right? Like taking uh, an extra kind of, for those universities that are particularly risk averse, let's say, kind of going out of their way to somehow make sure they're gonna scrub these kinds of phrases or concepts or, you know, that headquarters, wherever it is uh, from their campus so that they can't, you know, be investigated. And I think that kind of is a, a perfect illustration of the, the chilling effect. Um, uh, you know, Emerson, would you would you agree with that sense of the, the kind of vagueness here? Yeah, I mean, that's the point, right? The idea is to make people wonder and, you know, they don't want to have to enforce this. And I think it's realistically the idea that they're going to pull funding from somebody because somebody held some kind of um, event. I mean, I think that a legal challenge to that kind of move would be be very strong on First Amendment grounds, but it would still be a huge pain, right? To have to go through litigation, to have to fight back against some kind of allegation, some kind of investigation. The, the federal government doesn't want to have to investigate or take action. They're trying to get, uh, you know, they're trying to have the chilling effect and it's, and it's working, unfortunately. And I think it does come back to this distinction. And there's a question in the chat from Liliana Garces, I think, about whether universities are actually covered. And the truth is I haven't talked to university general counsels. I don't know if there are any on this call. I suspect that the, it has something to do with their risk aversion, but also whether it has to do with um, the university as a contractor. And I, I don't know what kinds of contracts universities have with federal entities or federal, the federal government. Uh, so I assume that some are gonna be actually more exposed than others, just based on the kinds of funding that they might have or not have. Uh, but I think it's, you know, because we don't know, there is good reason to be, um, you know, small c conservative with the idea that this is gonna cover uh, a broad range of, of, of different types of federal funding. And that's why I think that the, the distinction between grantees and, and contractors is so important. Because if, if, if you think you might be a contractor, uh, then it is a, a huge problem. Well, what about, um... You know, I want to ask you this question, Jennifer. I know you don't really lead diversity trainings, um, but 
you know, one of the criticisms that has going to a great deal of traction this summer is this notion that diversity trainings writ large, simplified, are themselves racist and sexist, right? This is this notion that has been promulgated by many people. Um, and that actually they kind of say that because those um, programs um, are so kind of strong in their views that people who have to sit through them, people who have forced to take them when they don't want to, they're being indoctrinated, they're being silenced or chilled themselves. And so for that kind of person, you know, they look at this order and they might say, look, this is the Trump administration um, protecting free speech, protecting the voices of a, of a minority population who feels uh, silenced. And it makes sense. And it's under the purview of the government to defend those, you know, minority viewpoints and, and make sure that federal funds aren't supporting the chilling of speech. I'm just curious how you respond to that set of the contentions. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I, I don't know whether, you know, John, it was you or someone else um, in Pan America, or if I was watching an episode of the West Wing, but um, I think what you want is more speech rather than less, right? That's what we want. We want, we want to have more speech and not Decide. I mean, and listen, there's plenty of things that go on on university campuses that I have a problem with. And that, you know, I do not want Ann Coulter coming to my college campus anytime soon. She actually already has apparently. So, um, but you know, if they, if the, if the young Republicans want to invite Ann Coulter and use their money to do that, that that's their right. And it is my right not to show up. Um, or I can, I can show up and, you know, turn my back to her, which is, I think one of the things that did happen when Ann Coulter came. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't currently lead diversity trainings, but I'll tell you this, I applied for an NEH grant to run a summer institute called Racial Literacies in which um, the institute would have invited, you know, by application faculty from community colleges through four-year institutions to come and join us in Colorado to talk about race and racism and how to incorporate um, various aspects of race and racism and critical race theory into um, people's teaching from a variety of humanities and social science disciplines. Um, I received the reviews, which were stellar, and we were we were not granted um, the grant, which, to be honest, I'm not surprised by. Now, I'm not trying to say that it was purely based on politics, but I will say, as somebody who regularly reviews things, there is a disconnect between the feedback we got, which was entirely positive, and the end result, which is that we weren't funded. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna reapply, because uh, you know, there's an election coming up and who knows. Just, you know, yeah, just to pick up there. I mean, the, the, the short-term chaos is certainly intentional, but there is some hope that, um, you know, we may not have to deal with this uh, you know, in reality, in force for very long. I'm not going to say more, but the uh, one thing I wanted to bring up in response to the uh, Diana Kramer's question, which I, I can't tell you sort of where they're going to draw the line in terms of contractors or not contractors and where the, the research, how they're going to consider those types of research. Unfortunately, that's out. It's not, I can't give you legal advice and it's outside of my scope of expertise in terms of university funding. But what I would point your direct, your, in case you end up in some discussions internally and you need an argument for why you shouldn't have to change anything. One thing to note is that there's an exemption for like academic discussions of these ideas. Now it says you're like academic discussions without supporting them. So this basically is, is a carve out for discussing critical race theory in a course as something that exists without endorsing it. I think, you know, how they would try to enforce that is hard to imagine and that a court would allow them to do so if you actually got to that point is also hard to imagine. Obviously, the confusion, the pain in the butt of having to go through the rigmarole is the point. But I do think that even as written, it shouldn't touch classroom discussions of these issues. Trainings, which are more explicitly have an objective of convincing you to change your thoughts and behavior are probably gonna be a little bit harder, but syllabi, 
I mean, that should be very, very low on the list. I can't say that they would never try to crack down on that. Who knows what they would try to do. Um, but I think the message is to, to, to chill. And there is a carve out for academic discussions in case that's worth, that's useful in your internal you know, I mean, deliberations. It's just incredible to consider, right? That we're seeing so much confusion about this. And, and yet this like carve out that you're describing, which I've also seen a few people discussing, you know, no one has really centered on that as, um, look, they have that carve out. And so this is mean, this means this, or this means that, and we don't have to necessarily buckle under this pressure. I think, you know, a lot of the times, one of the biggest challenges for most people really with regard to the law is that we tend to think of it as a black and white thing. It's like, this was, uh, you know, it's legal or it's not, there's an executive order against it or it's not. And so maybe it's that kind of ambiguity that you as an ACLU expert are familiar with from free speech cases. Uh, but that kind of the general public and, you know, the general professoriate, the general kind of administrative um, uh, realms of people who run universities are like, oh, well, now the, now the government says that word or that course or that concept is, is now um, one we can't use anymore, so we won't use it anymore. And they're not necessarily perhaps as well versed in, in all the complications that are kind of baked into this. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how much, like, not every... You know, university has a fully staffed general counsel's office. I think they probably often use, you know, private lo local lawyers. But I also can't imagine, I mean, I don't know what, what those types of, you know, academic attorneys are advising their client universities at the moment. Probably caution, but I can't imagine that uh, they should be telling folks to change syllabi and cancel things and all that sort of stuff at this point. I think maybe that's more of a policy decision. Maybe maybe some general counsels are making are giving that type of advice. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I can't give legal advice. I can't tell any given university sure. what they should or shouldn't do. Uh, but I think it's 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 totally valid to be outraged. Um, but I don't think that we're going to see a massive amount of direct enforcement in the short term. What's up? Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, can I can I ask a question of Emerson, which is to flag Laura Williams and hi, Laura. Yeah, I'm trying, <laughs> to, I'm trying to keep up with the chat. If there are a few questions I'm, I'm not to totally getting, but yes, so go ahead. Laura's comment is that um, their university is says, do not assume this will go away after the election. And um, and I think someone else wrote in the chat, um, Carol Chomsky, I assume that the EO could be withdrawn if Biden is elected. So I, I guess that is my assumption, too, right, that that if Biden is elected, that this executive, he could just, yeah. I don't know, with a wave of the pen, sign away this, as well as several other executive orders, right? Yeah. And um, and so then we would not have to worry about this. So then I wonder, and I don't know if Laura wants to go off mute, so I'm, I'm sorry to, to um, but why then, so I'm wondering about the chilling effect lasting beyond this election. Because I, I do wonder about that. And I do wonder about any individual university or college's actual commitment to racial equity. If, I mean, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, no. And I think, yeah, I mean, again, you know, presidential power is also, <laughs> I'm defining my expertise very, very narrowly. But I think and my understanding is that executive orders are just that. They are um, things that executives can do or not do at their discretion. Um, so yes, I don't think that this executive order uh, would survive a change in um, the president. Uh, and I think to Carol's point, is this political? I think it's definite. I mean, I think, you know, it's uh, not the dog whistle, it's the dog foghorn. I think this was some red meat uh, to some sectors of the, of the White House's constituencies. Uh, and you know, I, I have to believe that on some level, like they don't even have any real plan for how they would enforce this. The point was to make us circle up and bang our heads against the wall, I think. Um, but the, um, sorry, there was one other question in there, but I can't remember exactly. So I'm gonna turn to the chat in a second. Yeah. Um, just before we do, just as a final question here, Jennifer, for you. Um, you know, you direct a center, you're a professor, you're president of this association. What is it that you're hoping universities and colleges could be doing now, uh, not just waiting for the election, but doing tomorrow, doing yesterday? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I want colleges and universities to really um, 
make real change. They say, you know, so in other words, beyond the solidarity statement that they care about um, various marginalized students and communities on campuses, that they're, they're actually going to enact structural change where we live. And that's gonna look different depending on various contexts of people who live in conservative states, private universities versus public universities. But I think by and large, again, this is what I saw after George Floyd's murder, that various institutions, including colleges and universities said, yes, we, we wanna, you know, we're committed to, I'm gonna use the really innocuous word, diversity, right? We're committed to diversity. Well, you know, what I've done at my own home institution is really to push and say, these are just words, what are the actions? What are we actually doing to better people's lives and to make students understand that these are not political issues in the way that it has been politicized by this White House, but at heart, we're talking about human rights. We're talking about the right of every single human being to feel like they belong. And I think, you know, when I've given talks on anti-racism and I really put it that way, it's really hard. No one, no one so far has challenged me, right? When I basically said, what I'm talking about is the right of every human being to feel like they belong. I mean, you know, so there may be professional racists who have been in the room and they just weren't comfortable telling me that um, they wanted to kick me out. I, I know that there are people who believe that, right? That they want the United States to be an all white nation. But I would hope on, on our colleges and universities that we would understand that we want to do better.